Hi everybody, in this video series I want to talk about special relativity and the reason I want to do this is because internet is actually full of people trying to debunk this theory. You can just log on YouTube and try to write special relativity debunked and you will find many different many different people trying to do this and uh, the funny thing is that these people are usually not physicists or probably not one of them is a real physicist and special relativity is the kind of theory that it's not very hard but it's at the same time the first theory that brings some non-trivial, non-intuitive consequences. And people are always trying to use the common sense and in physics it sometimes, and especially in modern physics, it's not possible to use this common sense at all. And special relativity is one of the first theories where common sense just doesn't work. And therefore, it's easy enough and people just can't get over it. And this is the reason why so many people hate it. And they also hate Einstein with it. And I just want to create a video series where I can explain everything the most simple way and the most detailed way at the same time. I want to be very precise with the definition of the special relativity because it's based on only two postulates and that's it. And most people don't realize this, but I will argue why those two postulates make sense. And from this, I will try to derive every conclusion that has been made in special relativity and trying to tackle problems like twin paradox and other paradoxes as well. So everything started with this set of differential equations called Maxwell's equations. And uh, if you do some manipulation, like if you apply a rotation to these two, you will get these two second order differential equations. And if you solve them for E and B, you will get the electromagnetic waves. And this is kind of interesting because Maxwell derived the, these equations to explain electricity and magnetism. And at the same time, it also explains light, which is really very interesting because light is an electromagnetic wave. And so we have a theory not about just electricity and magnetism, but we have the whole description of light, at least light as a wave. And it's funny that light is a wave, but at the same time, light can travel through a vacuum. This is very unusual for a wave, right? <laughs> and uh, this is even more interesting that there is this constant C in those wave equations and this constant is a certain velocity. And every wave equation has a constant like this. And if you consider uh, sound in air, for example, there is also a constant 
that is very interesting and that's speed of sound. And this constant, like speed of sound, for example, in air, it is always relative to the static air, you know? If the whole air is moving, then the speed of sound is also moving with the with the wind, you know? So, but what is the constant in the equations for light? There is this C, but what is the medium for light? And uh, this is where it all began, because we don't see any medium that light would propagate in. Because we see it propagate in vacuum, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see sun, for example. So this is the time when scientists invented the word ether. And this is where it all began. Ether should be a medium for light to propagate in, but this should be measurable, right? We should be able to measure how fast is our Earth moving relative to this ether. And uh, scientists tried to do this experiment and it's called Michelson-Morley experiment and I will talk about it in more detail in just a moment, but the result was negative, like the speed of light is the same in every direction. And how this experiment works is that we have a source of light and we have a half silvered mirror in the middle, two arms and mirror, mirrors on their ends. And we also have a detector here and we shoot a light beam to this device and it splits at the center in both directions. And <coughs> If there was no ether wind, then, and uh, all of, of course these two arms are the same length, then the light would be traveling the same speed in all directions, and we would get eventually the constructive interference at the end because there is no any time shift. So the resulting light on the detector would be just some of these two amplitudes. But if there is ether out there and our planet is moving relative to this ether, then we should be experiencing so-called ether wind. And uh, this wind would drag the light because light should be traveling with the speed of light relative to this ether always, right? It's the same as the speed of sound in the air. So if we conducted this experiment, but this time an ether wind would be present, then this ether wind would drag the light with it and the light would have different speed relative to the experiment in different directions. And uh, yeah, you can do the calculations, which we are going to do later, but I will just argue now that uh, the light from both arms would actually take different times to travel and this will result in a phase shift in light and we wouldn't get a complete constructive interference on the detector and this is what we expected that is gonna happen and scientists actually thought that ether must exist there were no doubts about it so it was about the measuring of the speed of ether wind, not about proving the ether exists. And 
that's kind of interesting that they were so certain about its existence and <laughs> yeah the result of this experiment is actually negative <laughs> like the speed of light were the same in all directions so like this experiment was repeated many times and you know that earth is actually rotating around its axis and also around sun sun so the speed of ether wind should be changing all the time so we should be able to measure the shift in real time and that's that was just not happening so now it's weird because ether doesn't exist and uh, some physicists actually believe that it might be tracked with the earth and uh, we, ju we just don't see it and therefore the speed of light is the same in every direction but it is not true for the entire universe but this was just I think naive approach to solve this problem but you, it's hard to say because this was uh, really different at that time you know I can imagine that some people actually thought this might be really correct maybe I would be one of them if I lived in that era who knows so now when ether is out we have a big problem with our description of nature because what is this constant C if Maxwell didn't use any preferred reference frame when deriving his equations because Maxwell's equations are just field equations so you give me a vector of electric field and how it changes and I will tell you about magnetic field and this is what it is all about and now we have this constant C that is the same for every reference frame and there is no ether so no medium for light to propagate in so there are many problems with this theory now but at the same time Maxwell's equations were already experimentally proven by Henry Hertz so this is really weird right maybe light is not a wave but something different because at that time we had just two different descriptions things should be either waves or particles and waves needed medium to propagate in and particles didn't but particles obeyed so-called Galilean transformations where speeds just add together but for light everything was different so we had these two theories that were inconsistent because if one of them is correct the other one must be wrong there was no other way around it and this is when Einstein came along saying that yeah ether just doesn't exist and it is Maxwell who is correct and this of course meant that Newtonian physics had to be rebuilt and at that time Newton was a god and therefore it was like very brave to question him and Einstein did it and he stated these two postulates that the speed of light is the same for every inertial observer in the universe no matter how fast you are moving you are always gonna measure the same speed and the second postulate that he 
introduced was that the physical laws are the same in every inertial reference frame. And this means that if you have a equations that describe some experiment, then these equations are the same in every reference frame. You can just put different velocities, times and positions in these equations, but they look the same all the time. And this gives you the freedom to pick whatever reference frame you want without losing generality. And just by these two postulates, we are able to build the whole special relativity. Every phenomena you might heard of, like length contractions, time dilations, and so on, everything is encaptured in these two postulates. And this is where it all began. Like, first paradoxes started to appear, like twin paradox and stuff. And I said that I am going to show you the calculations about this Michelson Morley experiment. But I feel like this video is already pretty long, so, so I'm going to create another video where I show them in more detail. So stay tuned for that. And for today, I think I said enough. And in upcoming videos, I will try to derive the whole phenomena about special relativity, everything and I will try to resolve all paradoxes that are heavily discussed among people on the internet. And uh, if you like this video, please give it a like or give a comment. I'm glad for every feedback you give me because it motivates me to do another videos. And thank you for watching and I see you in another video. Just don't mind it, please.